Ships from the ancient classical world were very simple compared to the sophisticated vessels we have today, or so we might think. Yet two huge pleasure ships built for the mad Roman Emperor Caligula were discovered, which challenged historians' views of the ancients. It took a fascist dictator to rescue these amazing vessels and to reveal the secrets which had been lost for almost 2,000 years. These ships were the Titanics of the ancient world. As ancient peoples expanded their empires, their ships became more sophisticated and elaborate. Our understanding of ancient ships has grown as the remains of more wrecks have been found deep under the oceans. As marine archaeology has improved with modern techniques, we are learning ever more about the technology of ships from the ancient world and their precious cargoes. Yet a discovery was made in the 1920s in Lake Nemi, 24 kilometers from Rome, which would blow apart all our ideas about ships of the ancient world. Ships of such a size and splendor had never been seen before. But who built these unique ships, and what would they reveal about the ancient civilization which created them? When the ships were raised to the surface of the small volcanic lake, their true scale and complexity could be seen. The discovery of the Nemi ships would rewrite history. Solving the mystery of the Nemi ships has been the life's work of one man, Dr. Marco Bonino. Le navi di Nemi sono molto importanti perché sono i relitti più completi mai trovati e anche a causa della loro grandezza. Si vede immediatamente che erano eccezionali. The two massive ships would reveal dark secrets of the excesses of the Roman Empire. On board were statues, sculptures, and incredible technology that had to be seen to be believed. What was the meaning of these strange bronze artifacts? And what were these huge ships doing far from the sea in a remote lake only a mile in diameter? The Nemi ships were enormous vessels. They measured over 70 meters long, 20 meters in beam, the equivalent of two regulation tennis courts placed end to end. For the scope, the context of Lake Nemi, these vessels would have just been breathtaking, sitting uh, inside the lake and really just dominating the whole environment. The sheer size of the ships sailing on a small lake like Nemi seems unbelievable. But for Dr. Marco Bonino, it was the extraordinary quality of the construction that fired his imagination. Nessun altro relitto di nave antica trovato sia in mare che nella terraferma è riuscito a dare tante informazioni come le navi di Nemi riescono a dare riguardo alla tecnica costruttiva e all'architettura navale. The Nemi ships were indeed a treasure trove for archaeologists and naval historians, but it was the remains of the opulent and luxurious furnishings which astonished many experts. We know they had marble floors, we know they had hot and cold running water and possibly also had baths actually on at least one of the boats. These were palatial houseboats with gilded copper roof tiles and mosaic floors and column drums. But on the other hand, they reflect the technological capability of Roman naval architects. Even the design of the anchor was revolutionary. Until its discovery, it was believed to have been an invention of the 18th century. C'era un sistema di meccanismi particolarmente avanzato che è stato trovato solo a bordo di queste navi. The mechanical devices on board the ships would shed new light on ancient technology. Yet there would be an even more incredible revelation. As the archaeologists removed lead pipes from the silt around the wreck, they noticed markings which astounded them. As they cleaned away the mud, the name of an infamous and despotic young Roman emperor was revealed, Gaius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, better known to the world as Caligula. Caligula became emperor in 37 AD at the age of just 25 years old. He was soon overwhelmed by the power and wealth in his hands. He gained a reputation as a cruel and sadistic ruler who squandered Rome's vast fortunes 
on hedonist pleasures. He solicited a kind of enthusiasm amongst the Roman people when he first came to power, but then very quickly the sources turn negative and tell us that he went mad, and they emphasize the indulgences of his reign. There are all sorts of stories of his cruelty that are related by Suetonius and others. Roman writers recorded how Caligula could not control his natural brutality and viciousness. He loved watching tortures and executions, and disguised in wig and robe, abandoned himself nightly to pleasures of gluttonous and adulterous living. Caligula probably was quite bloodthirsty. We know that he um, ripped the child from his uh, sister's womb who he got pregnant, so I think anybody who's prepared to do that must have quite a, a bloodthirsty, uh, macabre kind of attitude to life. But not all his interests were quite so gruesome. Caligula had a genuine love of the sea. He was the great grandson of both Augustus and Mark Antony, respectively the winner and loser of the great sea battle of Actium that had decided the fate of Rome two generations earlier. He was also the grandson of Agrippa, the commander of the victorious fleet and builder of the original Pantheon. Sappiamo del resto che mh, Caligola amava le navi. Le fonti antiche, in particolare Svetonio, citano delle navi che lui eh, aveva fatto realizzare, che si, chiamano, si chiamavano Liburniche, che era un tipo particolare di navi da, da mare. Ancient illustrations of Liburnians can be seen on Trajan's column in Rome. They were fast, maneuverable galleys, the favorite vessel of the pirates who had preyed on Roman merchant ships in the eastern Mediterranean. Caligula designed his own flamboyant version. One of the most interesting examples of Caligula's indulgences was his construction of a Liburnian galley, complete with a jeweled stern, multicolored sails, dining couches, a garden. And he used to sail in the early morning from Rome down to the Bay of Naples, part pirate, part king, part Roman emperor. From early in his reign, Caligula had been attracted by the Lake of Nemi with its sacred temple of Diana. It was a strange, mysterious place, far from civilization, a place where the Romans believed their gods and the spirits of their ancestors loved to frequent. The goddess Diana was closely linked with Lake Nemi. The lake itself was known as Diana's Mirror. Her cult, based on that of Artemis in Greece, was centuries old when Caligula came to Nemi. Diana è probabilmente anche in Roma, eh, come Artemis, una divinità della selva, del bosco, quindi del mondo eh, selvaggio, extraurbano, e eh, anche una divinità della transizione, cioè del passaggio, e, e quindi anche dell'iniziazione. Caligula became obsessed by the sensual cult of Diana at Nemi. He built himself a palatial villa on the edge of the lake, close to Diana's sanctuary. He was only one of many to be drawn to the lake by the cult of Diana the Huntress. Many of her worshippers left evidence of their devotion. The Romans believed that the gods had to be placated by the presentation of offerings in return for favors. An array of beautiful and intriguing objects have been found at the site of Diana's temple. This is one of the bronzes of Diana herself. Here she is depicted in her short chiton, and at the back we can see evidence of a quiver. Sadly, the, the bow is no longer with us. She's also depicted with her arm up, and it is known that on her feast day, women who had been blessed by Diana and had prayers answered would parade carrying torches all the way to the sanctuary, wearing flowers in their hair. Caligula wanted to make his presence all important at Lake Nemi. A palace would not be enough for Caligula. His extravagance led him to order two huge luxury ships fit for the most powerful man in the world. His instructions were that the first ship should be a floating temple dedicated to the worship of Diana. The second would be a luxury yacht for Caligula and his entourage to relax. He ordered the two ships must be unrivaled and take pride of place on the lake. 
The summer heat in Rome was unbearable, and Caligula longed for a refuge from his troubles in the city. Only a year into his bizarre and tyrannical reign, many Romans had become outraged by Caligula's lavish spending and eccentric behavior. In the eyes of his people, he was becoming an unstable leader. Forces were massing against him in Rome, and there were rumors of conspiracies to overthrow him. Caligula would escape from the city to his sanctuary at Lake Nemi, a place where he was once more surrounded by peace and tranquility, with the heat and politics of Rome out of sight and out of mind. Once here, Caligula could concentrate on the designs for his magnificent ships. They would celebrate his great majesty and elevate him above all others. What he really was trying to do was to recreate the Hellenistic pleasure barges of Egypt of the Ptolemaic kings. Caligula was inspired by ancient writings which tell of the decadence of the Hellenistic princes. The spoils of the empire of Alexander the Great had been shared amongst them upon his death in 323 BC. They used their vast riches to live extraordinarily self-indulgent lives and to build incredible ships on which they enjoyed luxury cruises. Principi ellenistici amavano dare feste oppure anche compiere delle feste di, di carattere religioso, diciamo, eh, su navi eh, che si chiamavano talamegoi, che tradotte letteralmente vorrebbero dire proprio mh, navi da diporto. The largest of these floating pleasure palaces was the Syracusa. It was built for Heron of Syracuse around 240 BC and was believed to be 80 meters long. The Syracusa was said to have been the largest transport ship built in antiquity. On the upper deck, 400 soldiers were quartered. On the next deck, there were 142 first-class cabins with many of the amenities of a modern cruise ship. The Syracusa was like a floating hotel, furnished with lavish goods and even providing a gymnasium and a chapel dedicated to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. It had dining rooms, shrines, promenades, a library, all of these things that were so important to Hellenistic palaces. It was a kind of floating palace. We're told by Athenaeus that it ended up in Alexandria because it was so large that it couldn't actually dock in any of the harbors of the Mediterranean. And so Heron donates it to the Ptolemaic king of Alexandria. Caligula was anxious not just to emulate, but to surpass the Hellenistic princes of Syracuse and Egypt. But on a lake as small as Nemi, where could such huge vessels be built? A temporary shipyard was established nearby, perhaps even on the site of the museum now dedicated to the colossal ships. Il cantiere è avvenuto proprio sulle rive del lago e probabilmente proprio dove ci troviamo noi, perché questa è la parte più pianeggiante del lago. Caligula summoned designers from the Roman naval headquarters at Mycenaeum to work on his ships. His demands were a challenge as the ships had to be of a shallow enough draft not to run aground in the lake but at the same time be broad enough not to be made unstable by their heavy superstructure. It was a difficult task, creating ships of such unusual specifications. The palace ship apparently had one large building and several smaller ones with antechambers and corridors. It had no means of propulsion and was dependent on being towed. The designers solved the problem of breadth and shallow draft by building the ship with no fewer than five keels. The second ship, which carried a temple, perhaps dedicated to Diana, has proved easier to reconstruct. The temple was at the rear of the vessel, and there was a small square building at the prow with colonnades connecting the two. The temple ship was equipped with benches and outriggers for at least a hundred oarsmen. Workmanship on both vessels was of the very highest quality. Le tecniche di costruzione comunque erano veramente molto avanzate, quindi questo presuppone a monte uno studio e una, un progetto ben preciso. It was on extravagant projects like these two extraordinary ships that Caligula frittered away the riches so carefully accumulated by his miserly predecessor Tiberius. But what actually went on 
on board these ships. It's obvious from the elaborate remains, the opulence, that hedonistic pursuits were high on the agenda of the Roman emperor and his friends. The marble, the mosaics, the elaborate decoration. This was a playground for Caligula and his mates. I think there must have been a, a lot of dreams met on these ships. He was living out his fantasy life in this surreal, mystical place on these wonderful palace boats that, let's face it, only he had them. Nobody else at that time would have had the nerve to spend so much of the Roman taxpayers' money living such a life. Among the most extraordinary artifacts discovered on the ships was a series of bronze animal heads designed to moor the small boats on which Caligula and his friends were ferried to and from the shore. The bronze decorative are, without doubt, the most famous decoravano le testate delle travi e avevano una funzione apotropaica, cioè di allontanamento del male. When the bronzes were first revealed from the wreck, there was an excitement and shock wave which engulfed the archaeological world. The quality of the bronze casting indicated that there was a very magnificent find at the bottom of Lake Nemi. But what other treasures and ideas would also be found? Giuseppe Pinaghini, the director of the Nemi Museum, has in her basement an Aladdin's cave which demonstrates the technical virtuosity of the Roman shipbuilders. This is the magazine that we are now putting in place, where are exposed a bit of materials from the navy and a bit of materials from the territory, in particular from the Sanctuary of Diana, to which, by the way, the navy was connected, as we will see later. E tra i materiali delle navi ci sono questi tubuli fittili che servivano per sostenere un pavimento, permettere che questo venisse riscaldato. So amazingly, the discovery of these terracotta tubes proved that these gigantic ships had an elaborate underfloor heating system, which would allow the emperor to walk over ornate underfloor heating almost 2,000 years ago. The clay cylinders stood on a layer of tiles placed on the ship's deck. Around the cylinders, a supply of hot air was circulated, heated by a furnace below decks. Walls were constructed in between the rows of cylinders, which supported a floor topped by a lavishly decorated mosaic. The mosaics on board, although perhaps not as grand as this example from Arles, France, would have had colorful and intricate designs. During excavation, small fragments were found of the ship's beautiful mosaic floors. The underfloor heating on Caligula's ships was an unusual application of the hypercoarse heating systems used in thermal baths and palatial villas throughout the empire. Just because Caligula was on a ship did not mean that he could not have the luxuries of his palaces around him. But there would also be other strange objects connected to the water system which would baffle and intrigue the archaeologists at Nemi. For hidden in the mud around the wreck would be a bronze tap which looked too modern to belong to a Roman ship. But it was genuine. This extraordinary tap was made to control the flow of water into the ship's water storage tanks. From these tanks, water would be distributed throughout the ships by gravity through a series of lead pipes interspersed with bronze valves. The archaeologists of the 1920s couldn't believe it was nearly 2,000 years old. E il rubinetto in bronzo era in qualche modo collegato, però eh, è stato trovato a parte, da solo. Quindi non, eh, non sappiamo, cioè si può ricostruire come avveniva il collegamento. When discovered, the bronze tap was almost free of corrosion. Thanks to its brilliant design, which tapers very slightly, and its precision engineering, it still makes a watertight seal when lowered into place. Remarkably, precision instruments of bronze like this tap are still being made today by almost exactly the same methods as those used by the Romans. The finds on the Nemi ships proved that the Romans used sophisticated casting techniques and were more skilled than was previously thought. The only difference between this modern tap and the Nemi one is 2,000 years. The tap found on the Nemi ships meant that we would have to rethink our perceptions of Roman engineering. 
But among the biggest surprise to greet the archaeologists was the complex construction of the ships themselves. I think if you asked anyone today how to go about building a ship, they would undoubtedly say you erect a skeleton of frames or ribs and then you wrap the planking around that skeleton. Um, but in antiquity, uh, the process was very different. The planks of the hull were connected to one another using mortise and tenon joinery. And then the frames of the vessel or the ribs uh, were added into, actually inserted into that, that existing shell. The construction of the ship's timbers was so well preserved that it allowed scholars to examine in precise detail these Roman shipbuilding techniques. But there were other examples of this technique from the outer reaches of the Roman Empire. At Mainz in Germany in 1981, a group of five Roman ships was discovered, which are now on display in the Mainz Museum of Ancient Shipping. Das ganze Wrack ist übersät mit Nutfederverbindung, alle 25 bis 30 cm eine Verbindung, ein kleines Brettchen, das für das jeweils sich gegenüberliegende Nuten vorbereitet werden mussten. Im Wrack sind die Nutfederverbindungen nicht voll sichtbar. Man sieht nur die Sicherungsstifte, die verhindern sollten, dass sich Planken wieder auseinanderarbeiten. Although 700 years later than the Nemi ships, the mined ships are firmly in the shell-first construction tradition that we now know existed throughout the Mediterranean. Eine Gemeinsamkeit ist etwa die Art und Weise, wie Spanten und Außenhaut miteinander verbunden sind. Die Nägel wurden durch Bohrung getrieben, auf der Innenseite zweifach gekröpft und dann die Spitze zurückgeschlagen. Das gibt eine sehr feste, zugleich aber auch flexible Verbindung, die so ein, ein wenig Schlupf, so ein wenig Bewegung zulässt. There have been suggestions that the iron nails used on the Nemi ships were covered in a film of copper to resist rust. Richard Windley demonstrates the process. There is a theory that the Romans used a kind of electrolytic coating process to stop iron nails from rusting. What we're going to try and demonstrate is how that process works. This is the solution which we have here, which is a mixture of copper nitrate and an acidic agent. And we're going to place the nail into the copper solution. And the plating process should begin. The process is an intriguing one. Some experts believe that the nails used on the ships were electrolytic copper. Others believe that they have lasted so well because copper was used in the smelting process. In the basement of the museum, the storeroom reveals yet more amazing detail about the whole construction of the Nemi ships. You can see all these cases that contain millions and millions of nails Eh, che eh, servivano per fissare i legni delle eh, due navi. Ne vediamo qualcuno, ecco questo, che vedete piegato appositamente e che doveva servire per collegare due eh, assi del, dello scafo. E questi altri, in cui vedete in alcuni di questi sono ancora parti della lamina di piombo che faceva da rivestimento alla nave. The traditional methods of shipbuilding used on the Nemi ships can be traced back to ancient Egypt. Ancient Greek triremes, like this one carved on a rock in Rhodes, were also built using the same techniques. By Caligula's time, the construction ideas employed on the Nemi ships had already been in use for hundreds of years on the merchant ships which carried goods around the Mediterranean. The Romans had become experts in developing this technology, which was crucial to their infrastructure. Pottery, glass, metals, wine and olive oil were all important trade goods, as well as the grain that supplied Roman citizens. Glass became particularly prized, and silk from China, incense from Arabia, and spices from Southeast Asia were all essential for the well-to-do Roman lifestyle a lifestyle which would have been impossible without reliable ships. The large numbers of Roman shipwrecks around the shores of the Mediterranean testify to the scale of maritime trade as well as its risks. It's thanks to these wrecks that we know as much as we do about the extent of Roman trade. 
But for maritime archaeologists such as Deborah Carlson, there's always more to learn. There's a moment of discovery working underwater when you're airlifting sand away and you're working with an object, you may not know what it is, but there's always a moment when you finally realize what that artifact is, and that is actually a very thrilling moment. For archaeologists like Deborah Carlson, the area around the coast of Turkey has a wealth of ancient shipwrecks to explore. There's hardly any current down there. When we hit the bottom, try not to stir up because it's really a muddy, uh, Real silty, silty bottom. Yeah. These wrecks often have large cargoes of amphoras. Many are still in remarkably good condition. The amphora, a two-handled clay jar, was a common container used by traders throughout the Mediterranean to transport many goods such as oil or wine. Merchant ships were rated in terms of the number of amphoras they could carry. The size and strength of the ships was critical, so the Romans' trade was efficient. Yet in rough seas, many shipments did not make it to their destination. And it's often only thanks to the heavy cargo that any fabric from the ship that contained them survives at all. In the Mediterranean, the ships that are preserved are merchant ships, by and large. And this is because the ships carried a cargo, whether it be amphoras or stones, that weighed the ship down, that pressed it down into the seabed and preserved it. Deborah Carlson has worked for many years on the Institute of Nautical Archaeology's shipwreck excavations. The Institute is based at Bodrum in Turkey. Their expeditions have produced some amazing finds around the Turkish coast. This is a uh, partial amphora from a 5th century BC shipwreck. Um, and then actually we have a uh, more intact example down here, which gives you some idea uh, of what one of these transport amphoras looks like. This holds about 25 liters of fluid. We suspect that the amphoras were carrying wine specifically because we see the remnants of pitch lining on the interior of the jars, and you can see some of that here on the mouth. In one of the Institute's most productive archaeological projects on a late Roman shipwreck at Yassi Ada in Turkey, they found amphoras containing drinking water, wine, oil, fish sauce, cereals, olives, and fruits. They also discovered remains of clothes, shoes, and gaming dice belonging to the crew. Wood from the wreck is being conserved in the Institute's basement. Uh, these are the trays that hold some of the ship's timbers. And in this example, we see uh, one of the ship's ribs or frames that has been conserved in polyethylene glycol, or PEG. Uh, so this is what a ship's timber looks like once it has been stabilized and conserved. When the Nemi ships were brought to the surface in the 1920s, archaeologists discovered that the timbers were extraordinarily well preserved by the silt in the lake and by the collapsed material from the heavy structures weighing them down. Yet for many years prior to their discovery, local people had realized there was a mysterious secret lying at the bottom of Lake Nemi. The discovery of the Nemi ships is really uh, a story unto itself in that this is in many ways the development of uh, maritime underwater archaeology. Even in medieval times, rumors circulated in the communities around the lake about the wrecks of two enormous ships that could sometimes be seen lying on the bottom. It wasn't long before treasure hunters and archaeologists were attracted to the lake, and bits of the ship's superstructure, amphoras and pieces of timber, were laboriously hauled up to the surface. For many centuries, Locals living in the Alban Hills in this area knew about these legendary ships at the bottom of the lake, and there were various attempts to, to salvage these ships and to get at them. As early as the 15th century, the famous architect and scientist Leon Battista Alberti had a floating platform built and tried to raise pieces of the ships by means of hooks. 
questi che vedete qui invece sono dei rampini che vennero utilizzati a partire dall'età rinascimentale quando iniziarono i primi tentativi di recupero delle navi che praticamente strappavano i pezzi di legno, le decorazioni e quanto si riteneva valido da essere portato a terra, ma ovviamente si distruggevano le, le navi e gli scafi. A century later, another historic attempt was made by Francesco Di Marchi. La prima attestazione di un sub, praticamente, il primo, eh, il primo uomo che andava effettivamente sott'acqua. Diciamo che la struttura che utilizzava, che era in legno, una specie di, di casco in legno con un oblò di vetro, era su progetto di Leonardo da Vinci con alcune modifiche. Centuries would pass until 1827 when archaeologists decided to suspend a diving bell from a floating platform on the lake. It was considered partially successful when pieces of sculpture and mosaic flooring were salvaged. Then in 1885, Lord Saville, the British ambassador to Rome, discovered 1,500 incredible items at the site of Diana's temple at the edge of the lake. The huge collection of artifacts was later donated to Nottingham Museum in England. He got interested in archaeology while he was in Rome and did a number of excavations before actually purchasing the license to excavate Nemi himself as the chief archaeologist on the site. It must have been completely wonderful when these votives and the sculptures started turning up to realize exactly what an important find you'd actually made. It must have been absolutely terrific. Ten years later, this bronze head of Medusa was salvaged from the ships, and research into the feasibility of recovering the ships themselves became more intense. The Italian Navy enlisted the help of an expert diver to ascertain the exact position of the ships. He found them 180 meters apart, around 20 meters down. But no one could think of a way of safely raising them, until a certain fascist dictator came along. Mussolini seems to have taken every opportunity to associate his fascist regime with the glory of Imperial Rome. And he did this by sponsoring excavations, not only in Rome itself, but at Ostia. Mussolini was determined to associate the glories of ancient Rome with his own modern-day fascist regime. Many of his policies and dictates were influenced by Roman civilization. He planned to become a modern Roman emperor and to rebuild the old Roman Empire to its former glories. Archaeological excavations at Ostia, Nemi, and throughout Rome were integral to his grand scheme. Mussolini was obsessed by Roman archaeology. He hoped that he could associate his Italian fascist state with the glories of Imperial Rome. If he could link ancient and modern Rome together, he would be able to attract the intellectual middle classes to his fascist regime. The Nemi ships would be important as a political weapon. People pursued wrecks underwater for lots of different reasons, and the motives behind Mussolini's onslaught of late Nemi's are very much in terms of linking himself to that glorious and great past and effectively making himself grander and bigger and more important through the importance of the Nemi ships themselves. By involving himself with the Nemi ships, Mussolini believed he could associate himself with a Roman emperor. I think the Nemi ships carried an extra fascination for Mussolini because they gave a rare opportunity for an intimate insight into the personal life of a Roman emperor. But Mussolini's bid to bask in the reflected glory of ancient Rome seemed fraught with problems. Plans to lift the huge ships off the bed of the lake encountered insurmountable difficulties. But Mussolini had a cunning plan. He would exploit ancient Roman engineering technology in order to reveal the Nemi ships to the world for the first time in almost 2,000 years. He wouldn't raise the ships, he would lower the lake. To lower the lake, Mussolini planned to use a tunnel which had been bored through the hillside overlooking Lake Nemi centuries before the birth of Caligula. This almost unbelievable feat of engineering had been carried out in order to save the Temple of Diana at the edge of the lake from flooding. Amazingly, the Roman engineers had bored a hole about a mile long through the mountain to lower the water level in the lake. 
Mussolini's archaeologists knew that this tunnel in the hillside existed and would undertake an audacious plan to see if it could be used again. For Mussolini, the salvage of the naming ships with the aid of such magnificent early Roman technology became almost a sacred trust. Mussolini said, it's a matter both of science and national pride, a debt of honor to the dignity of our nation. This Roman conduit, built in the fourth century BC, is one of the most extraordinary and least known pieces of civil engineering anywhere in the world. Perché ci troviamo in questo punto è molto importante perché qui troviamo le scanalature di paratoie che servivano proprio per chiudere il condotto del canale. Queste paratoie quindi bloccando questo, questo materiale impuro poi venivano rimossi attraverso quel pozzo là sopra da degli schiavi opportunamente addestrati che quindi mantenevano la pulizia dell'emissario lungo tutto il loro percorso. When the Romans built this conduit they didn't simply start at one end and work their way through to the other. That was too easy. They had two teams of excavators, one on each side of the hill, and their surveying techniques were so accurate that the two groups of workers met almost precisely. Qui siamo in un punto molto importante perché, come possiamo vedere, ci sono delle linee di scavo su questa parete che ci indicano il senso di escavazione di una squadra che proveniva dal lato di percorrenza. In questo punto poi queste due squadre si sono andate a incontrare. Infatti vediamo che qui all'interno abbiamo queste linee di scavo che sono nel verso opposto, cioè questo è il verso delle picconate che venivano date per produrre appunto il condotto, il condotto idraulico. On the 20th of October, 1928, Benito Mussolini arrived at the lake to switch on the huge turbines which were to pump the water up the hillside to the opening of the ancient conduit. Gradually, the water in the lake began to subside. It was a triumphant moment when the pumps began to push the lake water through the hillside. What would be revealed from the lake bed would astonish the world the two ships would be seen for the first time in around 2,000 years. They were incredibly well preserved. The sheer size and condition of the ships would even surprise the archaeologists. But most significantly, these two ships and their marvelous furnishings would provide new evidence of the life of ancient Rome. From the remarkable finds produced by the earlier attempts at salvage, the archaeologists had realized that they were onto something special and they weren't disappointed. Throughout the ships, the finely molded bronze fittings were breathtaking in their quality and condition. Each post head was individually modeled as a satyr, a fawn, or a nymph. Many of the gilt copper roof tiles survived, and the wonderful bronze lion head, which capped the steering oar and was equipped with a ring to secure it, was also in almost perfect condition. An enigmatic bronze arm turned out to be yet another symbol to avert the evil eye. Soon the archaeologists were hard at work making plans of the ships with details of exactly where everything was found. Before the discovery of the Nemi ships, we really didn't have a very sound idea of how ancient ships were built. And when the ships were raised, this provided naval architects and archaeologists an opportunity to really study and appreciate exactly what went into the construction of uh, a pegged, mortise and tenon built vessel. Accepted knowledge of ancient shipbuilding had to be reconsidered. The excavation revealed stone anchors like this one were a thing of the past by the time Caligula's ships were built. Exciting new information was coming to light as a huge quantity of important artifacts and ancient technology was revealed. A series of extraordinary mechanical inventions was discovered on board. This complex metal device has been reconstructed by the Nemi Museum. It's one of a number of chain and bucket constructed bilge pumps used to remove any excess water from the ships. Sono delle norie che funzionano con un sistema di eh, catena, in un certo senso con delle, o dei cucchiai o delle piccole vasche che servivano a togliere appunto l'acqua dal pozzo di Sentina. E per lo stesso scopo esistevano delle pompe a stantuffo che venivano ovviamente azionate a mano. This hand-operated pump was extremely technically advanced. 
It was a pump which used air pressure to move water around the ships. It's based on a design by the Greek inventor, Tisibius, and is an ingenious device. But how effective could an ancient water pump really be? Right, this is what we think the pumps in the Nemi ship may have looked like. This is a reconstruction which is going to be probably a third or quarter scale. What we basically have here is a force pump, and it would have been used for lifting or forcing water around a conduit system within the ship. It's double acting, double cylinders. The flow of water is continuous, as opposed to a single piston pump where the flow is intermittent. The pump lifted water from the tank underneath on the upstroke, and on the downstroke forced it out through a system of valves into the reservoir in the back of the pump. From the reservoir, the pressurized water was distributed throughout the ship. The design is extremely effective. Incredibly, the valves inside the pump were made of wood and bronze, but made an extremely good seal. The pump would be connected with the water tanks on board the ships, where rainwater was collected and stored for later use. But the pumps were not the only objects found on board the ships which created excitement amongst archaeologists. For discovered in the wreck of the ships was a platform which contained a set of strange bronze objects. Under close examination, it was deduced that these were Roman ball bearings. This was an amazing find, as it had been believed that it was in the time of the Renaissance with the work of Leonardo da Vinci that ball bearings had first been mentioned in history. But these finds would predate da Vinci by 1,400 years. Two sets of ball bearings were found, but what were they used for? Some believed that they were part of a mechanism to bring up the ship's anchor, but others believed that they turned a platform supporting a statue of a goddess. The platform would have been moved by a mechanism below decks, allowing the statue to magically move. One theory is that the platform carried a statue of Diana, but recently, an alternative theory has been suggested. For some believe that the key to Caligula's strange behavior was an obsession with the rulers and gods of Hellenistic Egypt. It's thought he had traveled there as a young boy with his father, Germanicus, and become fascinated by everything Egyptian. proprio dopo la conquista dell'Egitto da parte di Augusto vengono importati a Roma tutta una serie di eh, credenze di culti orientali e anche qui a Nemi infatti eh, nel santuario di Diana a Diana si sovrappone Iside questo forse proprio all'epoca di Caligola So is this why Caligola was so keen to build for himself a floating pleasure palace like that of the Hellenistic rulers of Egypt? Caligula was assassinated in the fourth year of his reign at the age of just 29. So disgusted were the Romans by his greed, cruelty and arrogance that his amazing ships were scuttled and left to rot at the bottom of the lake, only to be rescued upon the orders of Mussolini. But this wasn't the end of the story. A purpose-built museum was erected for the ships on the site where they had been built on the edge of the lake. The ships were maneuvered carefully into it and there they remained until, towards the end of the Second World War, the retreating German army set fire to them. The Nemi ships were almost totally destroyed. It was a disaster. È stata una grande tragedia che le navi di Nemi siano state bruciate. Qualcosa che potrebbe essere paragonabile al crollo del Colosseo o qualcosa del genere. Never before had ships of such magnificent quality, luxury, technical achievement and state of preservation been discovered from the ancient world. After they were recovered from beneath the water, the Nemi ships were available for study to scholars and archaeologists for less than 15 years before their final destruction. It's something we'll never get back. I mean, that's, that's information that's, that's gone forever. Restoring the wreck of the museum was a relatively easy task, but what could be done about the ships? La perdita è una perdita veramente irreparabile perché non c'è l'equivalente in tutto il mondo né romano né antico, proprio per le conoscenze dell'architettura e dell'ingegneria navale nell'antichità. 
The museum, lovingly restored though it is, seems strangely empty. Though some wooden artifacts, like the Roman anchor, miraculously survived, the two small-scale models of the ships themselves are dwarfed by the memory of the originals. Qui vedete li abbiamo restaurati da poco, sono alcuni dei legni che si sono salvati, un trave molto lungo e visibile esposto. Hanno ancora le tracce, addirittura l'odore del fuoco. The disaster seems catastrophic. But nevertheless, Dr. Giuseppe Nagini and her colleagues at the museum are determined to salvage something from the flames. Their ambitious plans involve nothing less than rebuilding one of Caligula's extraordinary ships from scratch. Si è trattato di costruire in primo luogo un disegno di ricostruzione archeologica. Fatto questo, si ho potuto procedere al disegno di dettaglio che ho dato al costruttore navale di Torre del Greco che ha costruito la chiglia che è qui fuori. By reconstructing the naming ships, archaeologists hope once again to bridge the centuries and understand the navigators and shipbuilders of the ancient world. Caligula's ships have made us rethink our ideas about the technology of the Romans. Previously, we thought of huge pleasure boats as the stuff of myth, but the naming ships have made us re-examine these thoughts. It was the size of these ships and their advanced technology that truly astounded the world. One day, if the plans come together, a replica of Caligula's temple ship will once again sail on the lake and once again show the world that these ships were indeed the Titanics of the ancient world.